Chapter Twenty One of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Twenty One. J. T. Maston recalled. It is they come back again. The young midshipman had said, and every one had understood him. No one doubted. But that the meteor was the projectile of a gun club. As to the travellers which it enclosed, opinions were divided regarding their fate. They are dead, said one. They are alive, said another. The crater is deep, and the shock was deadened. But they must have wanted air, continued a third speaker. They must have died of suffocation. Burned, replied a fourth. The projectile was nothing but an incandescent mass as it crossed the atmosphere. What does it matter? they exclaimed unanimously. Living or dead, we must pull them out. But Captain Bloomsbury had assembled his officers, and, with their permission, was holding a council. They must decide upon something to be done immediately. The more hasty ones were for fishing up the projectile, a difficult operation, though not an impossible one. But the corvette had no proper machinery. Which must be both fixed and powerful, so it was resolved that they should put in at the nearest port and give information to the gun club of the projectile's fall. This determination was unanimous. The choice of the port had to be discussed. The neighboring coast had no anchorage on twenty-seven degrees latitude. Higher up, above the peninsula of Monterey, stands the important town from which it takes its name. But seated on the borders of a perfect desert, it was not connected with the interior by a network of telegraph wires, and electricity alone could spread these important news fast enough. Some degrees above opened the Bay of San Francisco. Through the capital of the gold country, communication would be easy with the heart of the Union, and in less than two days, the Susquehanna, by putting on high pressure, could arrive in that port. She must therefore start at once. The fires were made up; they could set off immediately. Two thousand fathoms of line were still out, which Captain Bloomsbury, not wishing to lose precious time in hauling in, resolved to cut. We will fasten the end to a buoy," said he, "and that buoy will show us the exact spot where the projectile fell. Besides," replied Lieutenant Bronsfield, "we have our situation exact." Twenty-seven degrees seven hours north latitude, and forty-one degrees thirty-seven hours west longitude. Well, Mister Bloomsfield replied the captain. Now, with your permission, we will have the line cut. A strong boy, strengthened by a couple of spars, was thrown into the ocean. The end of the rope was carefully lashed to it, and left solely to the rise and fall of the billows. The boy would not sensibly deviate from the spot. At this moment, the engineer sent to inform the captain that the steam was up, and they could start. For which agreeable communication, the captain thanked him. The course was then given north northeast, and the corvette, wearing, steered at full steam direct for San Francisco. It was three in the morning. Four hundred and fifty miles to cross. It was nothing for a good vessel like the Susquehanna. In thirty-six hours, she had covered that distance, and on the fourteenth of December, at twenty-seven minutes past one at night, she entered the bay of San Francisco. At the sight of a ship of the National Navy arriving at full speed with her bowsprit broken, public curiosity was greatly aroused. A dense crowd soon assembled on the quay, waiting for them to disembark. After casting anchor. Captain Bloomsbury and Lieutenant Bromsfield entered an eight-parred cutter, which soon brought them to land. They jumped on to the quay. The telegraph? They asked, without answering one of the thousand questions addressed to them. The officer of the port conducted them to the telegraph office through a concourse of spectators. Bloomsbury and Bromsfield entered, while the crowd crushed each other at the door. Some minutes later, a fourfold telegram was sent out. The first to the naval secretary at Washington, 
the second to the vice-president of the gun club baltimore the third to hon j t maston long's peak rocky mountains and the fourth to the sub-director of the cambridge observatory massachusetts it was worded as follows in twenty degrees seven hours north latitude and forty one degrees thirty seven hours west longitude on the twelfth of december at seventeen minutes past one in the morning the projectile of the columbiad fell into the pacific send instructions bloomsbury commander susquehanna five minutes afterward the whole town of san francisco learned the news before six in the evening the different states of the union had heard the great catastrophe and after midnight by the cable the whole of europe knew the result of the great american experiment we will not attempt to picture the effect produced on the entire world by that unexpected denouement on receipt of the telegram the naval secretary telegraphed to the susquehanna to wait in the bay of san francisco without extinguishing her fires day and night she must be ready to put to sea the cambridge observatory called a special meeting and with that composure which distinguishes learned bodies in general peacefully discussed the scientific bearings of the question at the gun club there was an explosion all the gunners were assembled vice president the hon wilcom was in the act of reading the premature dispatch in which j t maston and belfast announced that the projectile had just been seen in the gigantic reflector of long's peak and also it was held by lunar attraction and was playing the part of under satellite to the lunar world we know the truth on that point but on the arrival of bloomsbury's dispatch so decidedly contradicting j t maston's telegram two parties were formed in the bosom of the gun club on one side were those who admitted the fall of the projectile and consequently the return of the travellers on the other those who believed in the observations of long's peak concluded that the commander of the susquehanna had made a mistake to the latter the pretended projectile was nothing but a meteor nothing but a meteor a shooting globe which in its fall had smashed the bows of the corvette it was difficult to answer this argument for the speed with which it was animated must have made observation very difficult the commander of the susquehanna and her officers might have made a mistake in all good faith one argument however was in their favour namely that if the projectile had fallen on earth its place of meeting with the terrestrial globe could only take place on this twenty seven degree north latitude and taking into consideration the time that had elapsed and the rotary motion of the earth between the forty one degree and the forty two degree of west longitude in any case it was decided in the gun club that bloomsbury brothers bilsby and major elphinstone should go straight to san francisco and consult as to the means of raising the projectile from the depths of the ocean these devoted men set off at once and the railroad which will soon cross the whole of central america took them as far as st louis where the swift mail coaches awaited them almost at the same moment in which the secretary of marine the vice president of the gun club and the sub director of the observatory received the dispatch from san francisco the hon j t maston was undergoing the greatest excitement he had ever experienced in his life an excitement which even the bursting of his pet gun which had more than once nearly cost him his life had not caused him we may remember that the secretary of the gun club had started soon after the projectile and almost as quickly for the station on long's peak in the rocky mountains j belfast director of the cambridge observatory accompanying him arrived there the two friends had installed themselves at once never quitting the summit of their enormous telescope we know that this gigantic instrument had been set up according to the reflecting system called the english front view this arrangement subjected all objects to but one reflection making the view consequently much clearer 
The result was that, when they were taking observation, J.T. Maston and Belfast were placed in the upper part of the instrument, and not in the lower, which they reached by a circular staircase, a masterpiece of lightness, while below them opened a metal well terminated by the metallic mirror, which measured two hundred and eighty feet in depth. It was on a narrow platform, placed above the telescope, that the two savants passed their existence, execrating the day which hid the moon from their eyes, and the clouds which obstinately veiled her during the night. What, then, was their delight, when, after some days of waiting, on the night of the 5th of December, they saw the vehicle which was bearing their friends into space? To this delight succeeded a great deception, when, trusting to a cursory observation, they launched their first telegram to the world, erroneously affirming that the projectile had become a satellite of the moon, gravitating in an immutable orbit. From that moment it had never shown itself to their eyes. A disappearance all the more easily explained, as it was then passing behind the moon's invisible disk. But when it was time for it to reappear on the visible disk, one may imagine the impatience of the fuming J. T. Maston, and his not less impatient companion. Each minute of the night they thought they saw the projectile once more, and they did not see it. Hence constant discussions and violent disputes between them, Belfast affirming that the projectile could not be seen, J. T. Maston maintaining that it had put his eyes out. "'It is the projectile,' repeated J. T. Maston. "'No,' answered Belfast. "'It is an avalanche detached from a lunar mountain.' "'Well, we shall see it to-morrow.' "'No, we shall not see it any more. "'It is carried into space.' "'Yes. No.' And at these moments, when contradictions reigned like hail, the well-known irritability of the secretary of the gun-club constituted a permanent danger for the Honourable Belfast. The existence of these two, together, would soon have become impossible. But an unforeseen event cut short their everlasting discussions. During the night, from the 14th to the 15th of December, the two irreconcilable friends were busy observing the lunar disk, J. T. Maston abusing the learned Belfast as usual, who was by his side, the secretary of the gun-club maintaining for the thousandth time that he had just seen the projectile, and adding that he could see Michel Ardan's face looking through one of the scuttles, at the same time enforcing his argument by a series of gestures which his formidable hook rendered very unpleasant. At this moment Belfast's servant appeared on the platform. It was ten at night, and gave him a dispatch. It was the commander of the Susquehanna's telegram. Belfast tore the envelope and read, and uttered a cry. What? said J. T. Maston. The projectile. Well, has fallen to the earth. Another cry, this time a perfect howl, answered him. He turned toward J. T. Maston. The unfortunate man, imprudently leaning over the metal tube, had disappeared in the immense telescope. A fall of two hundred and eighty feet. Belfast, dismayed, rushed to the orifice of the reflector. He breathed. J. T. Maston, caught by his metal hook, was holding on by one of the rings which bound the telescope together, uttering fearful cries. Belfast called. Help was brought. Tackle was let down. And they hoisted up, not without some trouble, the imprudent secretary of the gun-club. He reappeared at the upper orifice without hurt. Ah, said he, if I had broken the mirror, you would have paid for it, replied Belfast severely. And that cursed projectile has fallen, asked J. T. Maston, into the Pacific. Let us go. A quarter of an hour after, the two savants were descending the declivity of the Rocky Mountains, and two days after, at the same time as their friends of the gun club, they arrived at San Francisco, having killed five horses on the road. Elphinstone, the brothers Bloomsbury and Billsby, rushed towards them on their arrival. "'What shall we do?' they exclaimed. "'Fish up the projectile,' replied J. T. Maston, "'and the sooner the better.'" End of chapter 21